have to admit, ever since I was a kid, I was into comic books. I haven't collected any in a long time, but, you know, kind of stuck. Yeah, I mean, I got Spawn number one, X-Men number one, Deadpool number one. Still in plastic from when I got them in the 90s. I don't think I even knew who Ryan Reynolds was at the time. Deadpool's beating up Cable. And I'm a big fan of the movies, too. Yeah, even the bad ones. So it's not such a surprise that I kind of consider being a car audio engineer to be a low-level superhero. I'm not kidding. Got a t-shirt and everything. This is Greenwood. It's the stance that you would make after beating a particularly difficult vehicle. Saving the world from bad car audio, one car at a time. Not bad. So with a nice car and nice equipment, it's hard to think that bad audio is going to be a problem, let alone the villain here. It's not always as easy as a blown speaker or not enough power. Take this Land Rover Defender 110. It's a beautiful piece of engineering, powerful and ready for anything. Except for an aftermarket audio system. I'm tasked with designing and installing a system without sacrificing space or aesthetic. This client is a critical listener and also wants high performance. Don't take up any space. Don't change how anything looks. Make it sound amazing. Got it. With no information on this beast, I'm going in with nothing but my confidence and my arsenal of car audio weapons. I don't avenge sonic purity in cars just on principle. As with any good superhero, you have to have a motivation that's close to heart. I mean, I've had a system ripped out of my car before. Don't worry, this isn't a Bruce Wayne kind of story. One of my earliest childhood memories is driving through the mountains of Colorado with my dad. He's a musician and songwriter, so naturally we were listening to the radio. Nina's 99 Luft Balloons was playing, and I asked him if Nina was blonde. He told me yes. What a liar. I think he was laughing at his five-year-old boy for asking if Nina was hot. The point is, every time I hear 99 Luft Balloons, that's where I am. That moment I shared with my dad decades ago. He probably doesn't even remember it. That's not nothing. Not many things in life can take you back like that, to relive moments. I take periodic trips to Arkansas to visit my best friend, Scott. Scott Clayton, bass guitarist extraordinaire. We get together, solve the world's problems over chess, and write music for our band, Brave Crusade. Even our band name sounds heroic. We've been playing together since we were teenagers. That's a long time. And from day one, I had some kind of recording device going on. As terrible as those early recordings were, they captured moments for us. Moments of creation, laughing at what we just played because it was anywhere from spectacular to absolute crap. Everyone's a critic. The week before starting on the Defender, I took one of my trips. When I arrived, Scott took me straight to his bedroom closet. Stay with me here. I had a recent discovery where I was, I was noodling around. I used to take the guitar to the bathroom. The bathroom just has good acoustics. Um, so I'd be hovered over the sink playing, thinking this sounded pretty good. Well, it turns out I have kind of a long closet and I guess I was noodling around. I discovered, wow, that sounds really good in here. Now I won't play my guitar anywhere in this house unless I'm in this little closet because it just sounds so good. It has a natural reverb. And you know, I've got guitar amps that I can play with if I wanted to, we just don't need that in here. I mean, it just has a nice sounding quality to it. I saw an opportunity to take a beautiful acoustic piece, record it, and play it in the Defender when I do the build a few weeks later. I'm gonna to illustrate to you how I captured one of these moments in Scott's Arkansas closet and set the stage to accurately reproduce it in this Land Rover in Colorado.
When faced with an adversary as formidable as this defender, I have to draw from all of my resources to preserve these moments. I'm no stranger to taking my lumps in these confrontations, but man, sometimes you can be tested. Going in blind, I'm going to rely heavily on the power of my greatest weapon in my car audio engineer superhero arsenal. The digital signal processor. The frequencies I'm responsible for reproducing in this Defender fall between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. Scott's guitar piece takes up a range something like this. Our system has to be able to play anything in the spectrum. I also have to take into account that we don't hear everything in a linear fashion. Our ears are more sensitive in certain frequencies and less in others. If I tune to a completely flat curve, it would sound really boring. Going for the sonically neutral response is an effort to recreate the monitors in front of a studio engineer. If we're being musical purists, we just want to hear what they heard. The job of reproducing the range of frequencies is divided among several drivers. This is so they can be more sensitive. Generally, the narrower the range of frequencies that a speaker is asked to reproduce, the more sensitive it is. I'm using a three-way set of Dynaudio Esitars and a hybrid audio 12-inch subwoofer to do this. Crossover points are designed to cut off the signal going to each speaker to make sure that it stays within its design range of power applied. Here you can see how each speaker covers a portion of the sound spectrum. Sub, mid-bass, mid-range, high frequency. Crossing over the speakers is just a starting point. Once in the vehicle, the acoustic response of each driver is changed. For one, they're all pointed in different directions. That's a recipe for chaos. Because of this, the sound reflects off all the various surfaces in the interior until it reaches your ears. All of that, and you're sitting really close to some of them, and far from others. You see why I feel like making a good sounding car is a superpower? I may not leap tall buildings, but I can sure as hell climb stairs till I get there. I take my time getting into this Defender. I've never worked on this model, and it's designed a little bit differently. I use hand tools for a lot of things like this. A slip is too easy with a drill, and the interior of these doors are painted. With the panel removed, sound deadening is a breeze. Just like the recording process, starting with a forgiving acoustical foundation will make things much easier later. Getting into the panels, I can see what I'm up against in mounting these esitars. The mid base is easiest. A simple acrylic baffle with the driver mounted off center will do it. Losing up the superhero skills. The mid range is a little harder. It's bigger than the OEM mid, but I think I can handle this one too.
unlucky so far. The Dyna Audio SSR tweeter. Sonically pure, accurate, beautiful, enormous. Square peg, meet round hole. At times like this, when Thanos has his boot firmly on my face, I call on my 12 volt superhero collective. A while ago, I met with my friend Tom at Music Hard Northwest in Portland, Oregon. He had shown us how he mills down the tweeters to fit where he wants. Quick text to make sure I didn't hallucinate this option, and I feel confident on what I should do. I take the tweeter apart very carefully. Instead of milling down the aluminum, I make a copy out of acrylic. This way, I can build it into the sail panel without stressing so much. I want to retain the OEM grill, so I cut carefully to make sure that I don't damage it. It looks like about a three quarter inch build out will let this guy fit in there. A quick test fit, because that's all you need, and I build the structure out of ABS.
Once it's solid, I body fill and shape it to as closely resemble the original as possible. After that, some filler primer and paint. All of this worked to fit really nice speakers in less than ideal positions. In the past, short of heavily modifying cars and moving driver's seats, this would be about it. Here's how a DSP addresses the problems a normal vehicle interior presents. As I mentioned before, crossover points allow me to choose different ways of distributing signal to different speakers. Each channel has a level for it, so I can adjust the volume of each speaker independently. I add fractions of milliseconds of delay to the speakers closest to me to align with the arrival time from the farthest. This Helix gives me a 31 band graphic EQ for each channel. Analyzing the acoustics of the vehicle, I can see what the journey of the sound from the speaker to the listening position is doing to the response. Watching the effects live, I nudge each frequency of the speaker to get the response curve I want. Simple enough, huh? Sure, but how much work did it take to get there? One of the things I love about the process of tuning a processor is how revealing it is. If there's something wrong, you'll know it. I find myself making some pretty drastic corrections in this term. That makes sense, being I'm using a collection of signals already subject to processing from the factory radio, but it's still a bit much. The bass response should be much more than what I hear in this vehicle. I'd gone through some lengths to make sure the subwoofer was as effective as possible. The original plan in the trunk had been to build a temporary modular enclosure for the Helix sub and build it cosmetically in the next vehicle. It turns out the spot that we assumed was the OEM amplifier was actually the blower for the rear AC. With the available space, it made sense to build everything including the amp rack into the floor. This way, I can unbolt it and bolt it into the next Defender. To make sure we got as much bass response as possible, I built the enclosure double baffled and solidly mounted to the vehicle. I added a cross brace between two factory mounting points front and rear. The idea is to pass as much resonance from the movement of the subwoofer to the body of the vehicle.
So why am I having to raise a bunch of low frequencies in the processor? It's clear I need to take a hard look at my input signal. I had measured the signal with my portable RTA and seen the roll-off on the mid-bass driver. The frequencies were there, but I didn't see how drastic the roll-off was. I hook up the old computer RTA and take some snapshots of the response. Oh boy. It's clear I really need to include the subwoofer signal in this. The P6 has six channels of input, and Dan needs eight. I may be a superhero, but I ain't no miracle worker. Wait a second. I have a Moscone summing device. Everybody's pitching in on this one. I use this guy to combine the mid bass and sub frequencies. So now I have all my frequencies, except they're really different strengths now. High level, low level. So I find myself getting deeper into this processor than I've ever been before. I have to get into the internals of the P6 and reconfigure the inputs. For the most part, I've been lucky at finding good preamp signals, have adapters or aftermarket sources. But seeing how versatile these DSPs are is wild. Luckily, I built the amp rack to be maintainable. I do this as a favor to myself, but it's nice when you don't have to get in and change a lot of things. I designed the amp rack to mount between the cross brace and the floor. I stacked the P6 and the SR500.1, careful to make sure that I could still access the controls and mounting points. I like welding these things together because I know that I don't have to worry about it later. And I'm all against worry these days.
I pre-wired everything on the bench and dropped it in the floor. This makes particular sense because I need to be able to easily pull this out and drop it into the next vehicle in a few months. After some calibration, the results are much better. You know how every good action movie has that one last bad guy that you didn't expect to face? You know how sometimes it's an insidious twist where it's one of your own that has thwarted your attempts to make the world a better sounding place? Well, the story is no different. In this case, it was me. Let's say there was a moment where I realized that a quick test fit, a quick test fit, because that's all you need, not the best practice. Yeah, doors wouldn't close. Bad Dan. Now stand there and think about what you've done. Find your zen, Dan. Find your zen. Find your zen, Dan. Nothing is easy, not even here. Recording in Scott's closet is ideal acoustically, but not logistically. The studio that we usually record in is in the basement. The recording station is on the ground floor and the closet is upstairs on the opposite side of the house. I had to run several mic cables together to make it through the kitchen, out the door, onto the roof, and through the window. And yeah, I had a few bad cables. So that was fun. I kept the recording as simple as possible with one microphone, no EQ. Every note, resonance, buzz, and pluck of this classical guitar. Along with the recording of Pro Tools, I recorded audio onto the camera microphone. I did this with the idea that I could do the same in the Defender when I'm done. pretty terrible way to evaluate sound, which is why I don't typically demo systems on video. Here I can compare apples to apples through the same microphone, so I feel this is worth the experiment. <laughs> okay, so I have some backtracking to do. These sail panels. I take a little solace in my friend's words. 
you know, we've all made mistakes, man, and, you know, it's, it's, it's part of it, it's part of nature, but it's custom. Like Captain America, I can do this all day. It just might be tomorrow, maybe most of next week. These things take time. As with any superpower, weapon, tool, or instrument, the digital signal processor is only as good as the person wielding it. Listening to it with a client, we agree it's going to take some fine-tuning. I always look at these top-end systems as being an organic process. My only goal is to get the system to connect the people with the moments that move them. I can't pretend to know exactly what that means to each person right away. It takes time to get that vocabulary between each other to make it happen. It was fun to make a hard connection between a source performance and a real-world application. The creation of that moment back in Arkansas. All superhero metaphors aside, I feel like having an understanding of why we do things is a superpower in itself. The artists creating these moments for us to connect with are the real heroes. Clearing the path and setting the stage for artists to touch their fans is, well, an honor. the tools and equipment we have available to us today makes it reasonable to expect more from our car audio experience. Hopefully I've helped you understand where I'm coming from and given a general sense of the challenges that we in this industry face. the moments that you've spent going down this rabbit hole with me. If you can, do the obligatory like, share, subscribe, song and dance. Thanks again for your time. My name is Dan. This is American Soundscape. Take the long way.